Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it was exactly a week ago that we were gathered here in this place, even as other Christians gathered around the world, and the choruses rang out of Alleluia. He is risen. Christ is risen. What a time of joy and triumph and tremendous, tremendous hope. And if you and I know much about anything, we know about hope. Even when we are small children, we know a lot about hope. I remember at Christmas time seeing all those packages under the tree and hoping that the biggest, most brightly wrapped one was for me. And I would also hope for what was inside, an easy bake oven or a puppy or whatever it was that I desired that year. When I was in college, my hopes changed a little. I hoped I would find the right person to marry that I could love for the rest of my life. I hoped that I would find a job that I could have a lot of passion for. And a few years later, when I found myself pregnant, I hoped that my baby would be healthy. And I sure hoped I could be a good enough mom. And all those hopes that I just named, well, for the most part, they mostly worked out okay most of the time. But if we're honest, you and I also know a lot about what happens when what we hoped for doesn't become reality. We had hoped is a phrase that is heard way too often. It's heard in hospital rooms when we receive a diagnosis that we did not want to receive or when a treatment plan isn't doing what it is supposed to. We had hoped that the chemotherapy would shrink that tumor but the scan shows it's actually grown, and there are new tumors as well. And it's not just in hospital rooms that we hear those words. We hear those words in living rooms. We hear those words in courtrooms. We hear those words in high school hallways. We hear those words in therapist's offices. We had hoped that this marriage would work. We had hoped that the money would last. We had hoped that the bullying would not get to this point. And we had hoped that this time she would be able to stay sober and keep her job and live on her own. We had hoped. You know, when hope is in the future, it is a beautiful thing, just like we celebrated last weekend. It is what our faith is based on. It's at the very core of our faith. But when hope is in the past tense, it can be devastating. We had hoped is a phrase that reeks of disappointment and disaster and distress and even despair. And those three words are what we heard in the scripture that we just read together. This is the story that follows immediately following the Easter story that we read last week. Two of Jesus' disciples, not among that inner group of 11, but other disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking toward this kind of unknown town of Emmaus, and they're talking about everything that has happened those three days before. And Jesus walks up, joins them on their walk, but they are so caught up that they don't even recognize who Jesus is. And that's when those words come tumbling out of their mouths. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They had hoped that Jesus would be this great political figure that would be able to wrestle the power away from Rome and return the throne of David to the Israelites. And it did not happen. The person that they had put all their hope in had been brutally killed. And so they walked down this road and they felt lost. And we know what it feels like to feel lost. We feel lost when we receive that diagnosis or when our marriage is crumbling or when the bullying that used to just take place in the hallways of the school now follow you home through your phone and your computer. And at times like that, all we can do is just keep putting one foot in front of another, trying to walk through that fog 
taking steps not really knowing where we are going or what we will do when we get there. We can't make sense of things. And we're not even able to recognize the hope that is walking right beside us. So how is it that Jesus responded to these two disciples in their despair? Well, he reminded them of God's promises. Just like we do when we come together every single week, we pray together and we open the scriptures together. These are called, these, that is one of the four keys of faith development. If you have ever brought a child to a milestone here at peace, whether it is receiving their first Bible or it is first communion, we talk about these four keys of faith development, and one of them is devotions. And all devotions is, is reading these stories of faith, engaging in prayer together, singing the songs. Because by knowing these stories, our faith is nourished. And as Jesus walked along that road, he shared those stories. I bet he talked about Moses and how Moses, with God's help, led those Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. And he probably shared about Abraham and the covenant he had with God. And how even when those Israelites were unfaithful to God, God kept every single promise that he made to them. And I'm guessing that he quoted some, some of the prophet Isaiah's words about the suffering servant, the one who would be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, whose very life would be an offering for our sin. What he wanted those disciples to understand was that what happened in Jerusalem was exactly what God intended, and that their hope was not extinguished, but it was walking along beside them. And scripture tells us that their hearts were burning within them. Yet the pain was still real. Their eyes were still kept from recognizing him. They still felt lost and like all they could do was barely put one foot in front of another. And this reminds me a lot of a story told by one of my all-time favorite writers, Anne Lamott. She tells of how a young mother took her two-year-old son to Lake Tahoe for the summer. They rented a condominium there, and if you know about Lake Tahoe, you know there's all kinds of casinos there, and so any room that you would rent in a hotel or a condominium would include room darkening shades, which allows you to stay up late at night playing poker and blackjack and then sleep into the morning and repeat the pattern the next day. And so this mother and young son stayed in one of those condos, but it was one day in the middle of their stay there that something happened. She had picked her young boy up, her little two-year-old, and told him a story and sang him a song and laid him down for his afternoon nap in his little playpen in the midst of this very dark bedroom. Then she walked out of the room, closing the door behind her, and sat down at her computer, hoping to get a little bit of work done while he took his nap but she hadn't sat down for more than a minute or two when she heard a knock, knock, knock on the bedroom door. She rolled her eyes. She knew it would be only a matter of time before he figured out how to climb out of that playpen, and sure enough, today was the day. So she got up thinking she would just walk back in there, tell him one more story, and rub his back a little bit until he fell asleep. But when she got to the bedroom door, she reached out for the handle and realized it was locked. Somehow, that two-year-old had been able to reach up and push the button on the doorknob. Mommy! Mommy! He called. Well, she tried to talk to him. She tried to teach him how to jiggle that doorknob. But as a two-year-old, he spoke very little English, and he was notoriously bad at following directions. So she tried to jiggle it from the outside and pound on it a little bit, but it didn't work. And pretty soon this little boy realized that his mom could not get into him. And he went into a full-fledged panic and started sobbing. So of course mom did everything she could to get in there. She looked for keys in the drawers and the cupboards, but they came up empty. So she called the rental company, hoping they would send some over to get someone over to get that door open. She just got an answering machine and had to leave a message. They were both extremely distraught, the little boy in pitch black darkness. 
And finally, she did the only thing she could think of doing. She went right up next to the door, laid down on the floor, and stuck her fingers in that little crack at the bottom between the door and the carpet. And then in a very quiet voice, she coaxed her son over, and she said, Find my fingers. Find my fingers. And eventually, he calmed down enough to find her fingers, and she felt his fat little fist grip onto two of them. And eventually, he stopped crying. They laid on the floor for a really long time. Finally, after he had calmed down sufficiently, she encouraged him to stand up and jiggle that doorknob, and as he did, eventually, it popped open, and the door was opened. Now, in Four Keys language, what that mother had just done was engage in caring conversation with that little two-year-old. She had recognized his need. She had met him where he was. She walked along beside him, or she laid on the floor beside him, as it were. She connected in a way that made a difference in his life, and she brought back hope that had evaporated. Anne Lamott writes these words. She says, I keep thinking of that story, how much it feels like I am the two-year-old in the dark, and God is the mother, and I don't speak the language. I just hold on to her fingers under the door. It isn't enough, and yet it is. And I wonder if that is how those disciples felt as they walked along that road on that first Easter. There was this huge barrier between them and Jesus, a barrier that was made up of unfulfilled hope, of expectations that just didn't work out. Until that is, Jesus connected with them with devotion and caring conversation. And he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it and he gave it to them. And Luke tells us that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. The door may have been closed to them in that what they hoped for had not in fact occurred. Yet the fingers reaching out for them underneath that door gave them what they actually needed. Jesus came to them and he comes to us in the breaking of the bread and in the promise of forgiveness when we put our hope in the wrong places. We do have a God who always has his fingers under the door. He makes himself present in hospital rooms when we get bad news, in living rooms when relationships are broken, in jail cells where people are feeling ashamed and abandoned, and in high school hallways when even though you're surrounded by all kinds of people, you can feel all alone. Wherever you are, God's fingers are right there under the door. And that Easter promise that you heard last weekend, it's still alive, and it's reaching out for you. Hallelujah and amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds always in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.